Okay. Uh, thanks, John and Brian, for inviting me. Um, I must admit that I'm not at all an expert in, in this field. Um, I've learned a lot just this morning. Um, but I'll try to do my best to explain what the ILL are doing to, uh, to make uh, the data that's saved and stored uh, intelligible to people that are new users. And actually, from listening this morning and from writing my talk, uh, I consider myself almost a new user, even though I'm a big line scientist at, at the ILL. So I'll try my best, but be kind to me. Um, okay, so I'm in charge of a machine called LADI3, which is for neutron macromolecular crystallography. So it's obviously a much smaller field than uh, X-ray, MX. Um, at the moment, there's about 100 neutron structures solved with pro of proteins, uh, compared to 100,000 or so with X-rays. So it's much smaller. Um, there's only about five or six instruments in the world, uh, two in Europe. So as you can see, it's on a much different scale. Um, so, in some sense, each of the different machines as well has its own software that's been developed in instrument control software and data reduction. We basically, probably the only software that we use that's in common is to do the refinements, which is Phoenix. So, so anyway, I'm going to try and discuss how to get from the raw diffraction to, to looking at these structures. And, of course, with neutrons, the key is that we can see the hydrogens and the deuterium positions. And that's important for understanding uh, things such as enzyme mechanisms and drug design and drug binding, recombining, this sort of thing. So it's just a classic figure of seeing the hist which histid the protonation state of the histidine and the, the spartic acid. So, so, so because it's a neutron institute, and I'm not so sure if you're all aware of the place, um, it's one of the highest flux uh, neutron sources in the world. Uh, it's a reactor-based source. Um, it's 58 megawatts of thermal power. Um, overall, it's funded by France, Germany, and the UK, but there's 12 other member countries throughout Europe. Um, and since 2010, it's part of what's called the European Photon and Neutron Science Campus, which is the EPN Science uh, Campus, which is um, made up of the SRF. The EMBL, the IBS, which is the Institute for Structural Biology, and the ILL. And that includes partnerships which are between the different institutes, like the Partnership for Structural Biology, Soft Condensed Matter, and the Unit for Virus Host Cell Interactions. Um, okay. So this is the uh, reactor core, and these are two guide halls coming off those instruments inside the the main reactor building. Um, there's around 50 instruments, around 40 of them are actually ILL instruments, and there's around 10 that are collabor collaborative research group instruments. Um, so there's a wide variety of instrumentation and techniques and um, different studies in physics, chemistry, and biology. So overall, in general, there's, uh, for diffraction, there's powder, single crystal, and small angle diffractometers and reflectometers, uh, inelastic neutron scattering, so triple axis, axis time of flight and high resolution spectrometers, and there's also um, inside the reactor particle and nuclear physics instrumentation. Um, this is the position of LADI, and uh, this is just a small little picture of it. So you can see I'm quite far away. I'm one of the, I actually built a new guide recently to improve the flux. Um, as you know, the issue with neutrons is the flux, many orders of magnitude less than with X-rays um, and so for MX, for example, we need to compensate for this with much bigger crystals. What we've tried to do over the last 10 years or so is to try and improve the instrumentation to obviously to reduce the size of the samples and the data collection times so that we can open the field up to a lot more interesting biological problems and not just do things which grow big crystals which is the case when I started my PhD 10 years ago. I think we've now moved, hopefully, to an area where we are doing studies that are more biologically interesting. So one of the things, um, there's about 800 experiments a year, I think, done at the ILL. Um, and all the data 
for all these experiments has been stored for the last 40 years or so. So it's not at all on the same scale as synchrotrons, um, but it's quite nice that we've actually stored the data. So I don't think there's such an issue with the, compared to synchrotrons with storing the data, but obviously this in the future may be more of a problem. Um, in 2012, and well, 2000, late 2011, discussion started about implementing a data policy, and it was implemented with starting with the third cycle in 2012. Um, this is a general data policy that defines the ownership, curation, and access to raw data and metadata collected and stored at the IR. So there's a, this web link here is, uh, gives you the whole policy um, in detail. I just picked out things which I thought were of interest or important. Um, so basically, the raw data and any associated metadata from publicly funded research um, is open access after an embargo period of three years, so similar to ISIS, it's perhaps the same policy. Um, in the first two years, it's restricted to the experimental team. Um, in the policy, it says that the ILL will provide means for the capture of metadata, not automatically captured by instrument software. Um, I'll discuss that a bit more later. There's certainly issues there because there's, there is an ILL standard software called Nomad, um, and this automatically, in principle, captures metadata. However, there's many instruments of the ILL which don't yet use Nomad, including LADI, um, and so a lot of these things for the moment are actually missing in this. I mean, this, the tools that I mentioned for um, storing and uh, archiving and retrieving data and metadata are also obviously under process, so they're not at all perfect. I've tried using them and see lots of things actually still wrong, but it's not really a criticism. I think they're just still working on it. So, um, so e each data set will have a DOI, and there are various online catalogues, such as data.ill.eu and logs, um, which in principle you can search and find the data um, and after the embargo period download this and so that you can reuse or reanalyze or do something else with the data. One of the things that I thought was maybe a bit disappointing with the policy is that it says that the ILO is not responsible to fully curate the data, uh, i.e. To, to ensure that software to manipulate the data is available. And I would say that that's actually quite an important thing to ultimately do, um, specifically because it's not really the same as the synchrotron world at the moment where all the, data, all the software is rather different and there's not really very many standards, especially when there's a whole diverse set of different instruments. Uh, so, for example, on my machine, it's probably difficult for new users to analyze the data without having proper access to a remote access, for example, to the data, to the data software. As mentioned, I think John mentioned it actually, that you, for ISIS, you needed, a, you needed to create an account to log in, and it's the same at the ILL. You need to, so the, the way that the ILL works is to submit proposals um, which get reviewed by subcommittees to decide which uh, experiments get theme time or not. You need to be a member of the ILL user club. Um, like Brian said, in fact, anyone can join as long as you've got, you can give a name, an email. You have to actually give your employer name and address as well. So well, maybe, I don't know if anyone actually checks who joins or not, but you have to do this in order to access any of these online catalogs. So easy, you just click on the new user and you fill in the details. So um, this is something then that they're developing at the moment. Um, so just to say that the data policy came into, uh, um, into actions, let's say, in the third cycle of 2012. So actually, all the data is still under embargo, uh, except what you can allow people to access the data in less than three years if you wish, but you have to contact the people at the ILL in charge of this, and um, so there is actually one DOI that's fully published that has um, all the details there, but the rest of them until October this year that were done in 2012, 
uh, aren't fully accessible yet. Anyway, to search, uh, you can either just do a general search for the files, or you can do some more specific searches, so on the cycle number, the way that that works is just the cycle is three digits where the first two are the year, and the third digit is the number of the cycle in that year. You can uh, search on the instrument, on the proposer, proposing number if you know it, or if you have a DOI, you can search for that. Um, so there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, when you do that, so for example, I put here the last cycle uh, and the LADI machine, and I get the five experiments that I did, so you can see that in comparison to uh, Gordon, Gordon saying he does a thousand data sets a day, uh, I did five experiments in 50 days. Now, obviously, this is a bit of a different level. So, um, however, they were all good data sets, and I was pleased, and that's actually quite a big difference I've seen over the time. I've been involved, so over the last 10 years, when I was doing my PhD, we were happy, actually, if we got one new structure a year, which might sound bad, but that was the case. We're now, uh, I'm now kind of upset if I don't get several structures five or six in each cycle, so more like, say, 20 a year, so that's moving it forward better, but of course, we're on a different scale. So, so the, the, this is the right-hand panel from when you search. You get the proposal numbers, you get the title, um, you get the instrument cycle and the, and the uh, instrument. Again, just the, the way that the proposal numbers work, it's you have, the, you have different colleges at the ILL from one to nine, they all have different, um, look at different things. So eight is for the structure of dynamics of biological molecules, and that includes for in eight keywords for separating out those different things. So MX is 801, and then it's just a number. So uh, that's how it works. Um, when you click on a specific proposal, um, you get details below it in a separate window about about the actual experiment. Um, so on this first proposal tab, you get the title, the abstract, which you can't show at the moment. Um, the sample I can't show, but it's for some reason you're allowed to see the title, which shows what it is there. Um, the cycle number, details about it. Uh, the links tab is useful because it gives you a, a link to the DOI um, and also to the user club proposal. Now the user club proposal is useful because it has a lot of information about the sample, the um, unit cell, the space group, what what experiment you want to do. Now it's not necessarily the case that what's given in the proposal is real to the experiment, but it gives them a clue. Um, DOI the same, it can give you the chemical formula and different information. So I think what the IL are trying to do is link all these different things together so that in total you have all the information you need to, uh, to, to reanalyze or use the data effectively. Um, as I said, yeah, the, a, lot of the soft, a lot of the instruments still don't have Nomad, which is the IL standard software, and so you have to perhaps extract it from other means like the DOI and the proposal. Uh, this is the only one that's published for the moment, the DOI, um, as it's so I can show it all. It gives the title, it gives the abstract, you can download the data, and the metadata there, and the log files, and the, the citation that you should use, the instrument it was done on. Um, so in here will be the um, raw data, the metadata associated with that, the log files that are considered important, um, yeah, so most of the information with me, and that's just the, this is, sorry, this is just, I couldn't put it all on one page, um, I've been able to see it all, so this tab down the side gives what, at the moment, the ILL is giving us as metadata, so the authors, the experimental team, what cycle it was done on, the proposal number, and then experimental parameters such as the temperature, the energy or resolution, uh, chemical formulas, what type of sample it is, uh, the size, um, unit cell, crystallographic parameters, the uh, cell, the space group, and what sort of container it was in. So I don't know if that's complete enough, but that's what they've decided to do at the moment. Uh, you click on members, you get the list of the team, 
Um, again, this should have information in this tab about um, about the actual data itself, but again, this isn't automatically uh, produced unless you use Nomad. So, Vladi's plans to use Nomad in the near future. Um, the data folders is the most important. It has the, um, these different directories, so the raw data is where files are stored. So, uh, the, a Nomad um, and most instruments that run Nomad do produce Nexus files. However, there's there's, there's instruments that uh, the ILL that still have ASCII files for their images. There's in, uh, instruments like Laddie that produce 16-bit TIFF files. Uh, so I think that although it's good that there's been that they've started working on this, there's clearly lots of things that need to be done to bring everything together. So um, sorry. So yeah. So there's the there's directory for the log files, process data, and the raw data. So what I do on Laddie is the raw data is obviously just the images that we collect, um, the log files and the um, processed. So the processed is perhaps, I, I split it up into the neutron data reduction. Um, I collect x-ray data on the same crystal afterwards. And so I also put the x-ray data there. And I also put the structural refinement folder with the refinements that I do in Phoenix. So the data reduction has all the input parameters. And I guess I can do this because I haven't got so many experiments. And if I had thousands of experiments a day, there'd be no way. But um, I can put all the input parameter files for the data reduction, which is done in Lowy Gen uh, and L scale, which is for wavelength normalization because it's a Lowy instrument. I can put all the inputs and outputs um, for all of these different things, the wavelength normalized MTZ, which comes out of L scale and the outputs from Scala, from Kate. Uh, in the x-rays, I generally use XDS, and so I have the input parameter files and the raw data, and the output MTZ and log files. And for the structural refinement, I put the starting MTZs and PDBs, and the refinement directories that are produced by um, Phoenix. So in some sense, they've got everything that they need to, 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 to do the experiment again. Um, so this is pretty obvious, but I, this is what is essential, or well, the minimum necessary information that would be needed to actually analyze the data, at least from Laddie. I'm not an expert in, in all the instruments, or, so I'd rather just focus on what I know about. So these are the key things. Obviously, you don't necessarily need the orientation matrix if you know how to use the software. It's not a black box, and you need to input certain things. So new users. Um, not necessarily capable in the first place to actually be able to index the data. I mean, I generally do that for them, and it, over time I've gained you know, experience in being able to do that. It's easy when the data is very good. You have to find nodal reflections. Uh, if the data is weak, it's, it can be difficult because you can perhaps have to extrapolate where the diffraction should be, even though it isn't there. Um, you need to know the wavelength range. Um, you need to know the angles step angles between images, the exposure time, and we do have a cryo stream. We can do cryo experiments now on Laddie, so we, so I guess the temperature, it's not necessarily important for reducing the data, but it's nice to know. Of course, you need to know the geometry, the detector. Laddie's a cylindrical detector, so again, it's a bit more peculiar. Um, and of course, the pixel size. So with all this, you should be able to get from this to be able to see um, the nuclear scattering density maps. Um, so, from kind of learning as I was trying to write this talk, um, for me there's a non-standardization of the formats and the instrument control software. Nomad needs to probably be implemented on all instruments so that the standard Nexus file format is, is then throughout. Um, personally, I think that they, they should perhaps, again, each instrument has different software and I think that these these should be somewhere available for remote access so that people outside the ILL could reanalyze and reprocess the data in a similar way that can be done with uh, Synchrotron. Um, however, I think it's commendable that they're implementing this data policy. I think it's important to open up the, the data. I think a lot more things can be done with it, especially as the software and instrument uh, software is developed further. Um, most of these issues that I've noticed, I've spoke to people in the, in the service informatique 
and the Department of Project Technique, and they say, yes, we're aware and we're working on these things. So hopefully, well, they haven't got much time before the embargo is over for the first ex experiments that they've done, but they, uh, they are, in principle, working hard on these things. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much, Matthew. Very thorough. Um, questions to Matthew. Camille? Uh, Cameron Tubek, um, Lance Florence. So, if I understood you correctly, it's not only the uh, raw data which is which are deposited, but also the base of um, data processing, right? And you show so this folder with data processing. Yeah. But I, I was just thinking about the general case. If someone submits raw data, the images, raw images from the experiment, uh, we and we know the final result, like the atomic coordinates. Should be uh, uh, should we also reveal in the way the data were processed? So all the uh, all the information which is in the input file for the um, data reduction program. Um, I mean, this is person. I. I I don't know if, and it's probably not the case that every instrument puts all their data processing in there. However, because of the uh, wanting to open up, and I have no problem with people seeing what I've done, um, and to reanalyze or perhaps to do things better. And for me, it's fine to have the, the files in there, especially because it's a sort of niche where there's not many people who actually know how to run the software and process the data. That this can maybe help people learn how to do it, and uh, for me, I've not got a problem with that, but, uh, yeah. Just a general question, shall we? I mean, maybe I'll get told off. Also, <laughs> <laughs> the raw data, because we have the raw data and you have the final, um, the final file, which is uh, like structure, right, and the, all the, which is between the raw data and the final structure, which is uh, the way of we process the data. Uh, should we reveal it to the public, or should be uh, rather a secret of, sort of uh, the experimenter? Yes, he's giving it, but it's like a, a question for all the cases of, of raw data. And the question is, if we, if, if uh, because we store the, the raw data with the metadata for, uh, for the data processing, and everyone can have his or her own method for data processing. Yeah, I mean, of course, they don't necessarily. I think I'm just, uh, it's just showing what has been done uh, in terms of get from A to B. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the people have to do it. So may, my idea of it being open access is to try and make it as easy as possible for people to repeat and to, to analyze or re analyze data. So probably you have different opinions within the instrument scientists, and maybe they need to discuss what we should put and what we shouldn't put. But for me, this is to try and help PhD students, postdocs who are new to doing this and trying to encourage more people in the MX community, which is huge, to come and be interested in making it easier, more accessible to me. It's I mean, idea. basically, I naive, uh, we are not robots <laughs> and uh, our science is not static and there are choices and options uh, and, um, yeah, sure, some of the choices and options uh, experienced person versus new person um, you know, is more obvious. But there are actually quite a few avenues to, to take in any given analysis and study. But what Matthew's doing is he's providing the, the avenue that you know, he, he favours as uh, clearly you know, well, one of the most experienced people in the world <laughs> in this area. Other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Matthew. Thank you. Sure.